Taylor Wickland. Here. Be sure to turn your mic on, please. Uh, here. Liz Osborne. Here. Patrick Hinterberger. Here. David McInerney. Present. Diane Christ. Present. Councilmember Yarbrough. Here. This is the Transportation Advisory Board meeting of July 11th, 2022, starting at 6.03 p.m. Thank you, interim chair. <laughs> Appreciate that. Um, yeah, a little different tonight. We're going to, we wanted to, with two new members, go through and just kind of do general introductions for everyone. Just um, short and sweet, but a little bit more information about everybody. We, we typically do that with the new, you're, you're now a new transportation advisory board, right? So just uh, maybe a few minutes, two minutes on from each of you, just kind of introducing yourself to the new members and let them introduce themselves as well and, and maybe give a little background on what your interests are and where, what, what kind of um, background you have in transportation or just what kind of background you have in, in general. So. Um, if you don't mind, uh, interim chair, be wonderful to start with you and and uh, maybe get the ball rolling. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Greenwald. I'm Elizabeth Osborne, and I've lived in Longmont for 30 years, and so I've seen a lot of changes. Um, I am an entrepreneur and have a tech startup. I become I'm interested in the advisory board for transportation because of my background, my law background is in disability law. And I am very concerned making sure that people with disabilities and people with um, lower incomes have the ability to get around in our town and that's what's important to me. Thank you. Next we'll go to David. Hello, I'm David McInerney and I'm starting my second year on the board tonight. Uh, I'm retired from a career in <clears throat> environmental and land use planning. I'm still a member of the American Institute of Certified Planners. I got interested in the board because um, I wanted to help implement Longmont's, envision Longmont plan, and in particular the multimodal transportation plan. That's part of it. Thank you very much. Uh, Diane? Hi. I'm Diane Christ, and I've been on the board since the beginning of the year. Um, I'm a business growth professional, so I work with a lot of businesses in the area. Back in uh, maybe 10 years ago, I spent a lot of time in Boulder and rode the bus and, and bicycled there, so I have a lot of experience with the um, transportation system here in Longmont. And uh, also last year I was a, a city of council, a city council candidate, um, also concerned about transportation. Glad to have you both here. Councilmember Yarbrough. Thank you. Um, I'm Shakita Yarbrough, and I'm on City Council. Can you you can hear me right? Okay. <clears throat> um, well, of course, the main reason um, for me is making sure that we provide equitable transportation throughout our community for the city of Longmont. And it was important to me because I really didn't know that much about transportation uh, within the city. So in order for me to learn, you're liaison on the board. So 
and I'm learning a lot. So that's me. Thank you for being here. Taylor. Well, I'm Taylor Wickland, um, self-employed landscaper, born and raised here in Longmont, Colorado. Um, but then my interest towards transportation is purely uh, uh, equity, safety, and affordability uh, to actually live in this community. Um, my main experience is actually, you know, going to school in Chicago, experiencing transportation there, traveling the world, living in Sweden, living in New Zealand, um, and experiencing different, different ways of how people do things other than here. So that's where my, my experience lies. And finally, Patrick. Hi, I'm Patrick. I'm Patrick Hinterberger. Um, been in Longmont going on six years. Um, my career thus far has um, been uh, a lot of time with a general contractor um, building transportation projects, um, roads, bridges, highways, um, those sort of things. Um, until recently, when well, not recently, about five years ago, I started a, a job with the uh, city of Thornton. So I also have uh, uh, experience with municipal um, work, working for um, local government. Um, I really wanted to give back to my community, to Longmont, when um, when I started looking at the boards and commissions and, and thought that the Transportation Advisory Board was the best fit for me to bring my experience um, to the city. So that's why I'm here. Great, thank you so much for doing that. Um, much appreciated. Sometimes, well, we won't. Sometimes the staff does too, but I, I think you know, basically, these guys have heard a lot. You've, you've already heard a lot, so we'll just skip right on to the rest of the meeting. Um, we do have an election of officers, and so we're <laughs> kind of hoping that our vice chair would be here, but uh, with that, being not the case, and we we did lose our chair with uh, with the recent uh, board switchover. So, um, would you, as there is quorum, would you care to go through and nominate someone for chair and vice chair from this group? Is do we have a motion? Regarding nominating people, everyone's sitting here looking at each other, so we'll start with a motion. Do we have a motion to nominate people? Alternatively, do we have a motion to wait until yeah, the I next think meeting? We could also push it to the next meeting, yeah. yes, thanks. I mean, that, that's definitely an option. We have two missing members, obviously, and so if that's, if, if, if Chair, Os yeah, and Chair Osborne, <laughs> yeah, there's nothing on the action agenda tonight either, so it's mostly informational. Okay. Piece. So if you're okay with that, that's that's fine as well. Do I have a motion to postpone the election till next time? I move that we postpone a nomination for chair and vice chair until our next meeting in August. I second. The motion has been placed and seconded. Do I have any discussion on that? Can I have, um, we said a raise of hands was okay. Can we have a raise of hands? Those in favor of postponing till next month, please raise your hand. The motion carries unanimously, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we do wanna just go over really quickly the designation of places for posting of meetings per state statute. And so you'll see that there's a quick little action item listed in your um, in your agenda or in your agenda packet that just says we um, typically post those right out here along the Kim Kimbark side of the Civic Center. And so, uh, unfortunately, what we need to do is have you still approve that as well. So, I'm trying to find. I think it might be out of order here a little bit in my packet, but, uh, oh no, it's the first thing on there. It's the action item on page three. 
And so approve the posting of locations for the agenda packets. Again, we, we talk about, this is really to say that we want to post it on the website as the key number one place. And it used to be, it had to be a physical posting in the building. And so state statutes, state statutes have expanded to allow us to do more of a, uh, you know, put it in an electronic version. So that's really what's being asked of you tonight is, um, would the Transportation Advisory Board be, uh, would they be able to approve or would they approve the posting site on the website? And then also we have those locations, the bulletin board located at the west entrance of the Civic Center Complex, which is right outside the city manager's office here as you come in the west doors. Um, obviously the front reception desk, anytime somebody comes into the Development Services Center across the street where we're all officed, uh, we can certainly get people the information there, the agenda packet or whatever, or the notice the notice of the meeting, and then the Facebook and Twitter accounts. So we recommend as staff that the TAB approve the posting locations as listing above, and we're asking for action from you tonight on approving that or not. Do we have any motions regarding this request? Yeah, I uh, move that we approve the posting locations as listed in the communication. I second. Thank you. The motion having been uh, moved and seconded, do we have any de desire for discussion, any discussion of the point? Uh, I have a point of discussion. I just have a question for the uh, council. Can you turn your mic back on? I think something happened where it fell out. Oh, perfect. Thank you. Do you also post at the transportation hub, or are you planning to add that in the future, the one at first in Maine? Well, typically we do the postings. I, I, that would be a public location, but there's there may be some issue of what's regional transportation district there mm -hmm. and what's not. I mean, we certainly can look at that. When they open, we could talk about how that would work. Uh, so we can we can think about that as we as it opens. Hopefully in five years. <laughs> okay. Any other discussion? All right. Having had discussion, let's have a vote to approve this uh, designation of places for posting of meetings as presented to us in the packet. All those in favor say aye. 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 Anyone opposed say no. The motion passes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll move on to communications from staff. We have a couple of things. We're starting to list them now, so we can remember what we're going to say to you. <laughs> um, yeah, we all appreciate that. But uh, real quickly, and these are just really brief kind of things, and we can certainly, if you have questions, please let us know. But the first thing is the Transportation Improvement Program. That's the, where we go for some of the grants from the federal government that run through CDOT and uh, Denver Regional Council of Governments and those those kind of uh, areas. And so um, we do have two projects that are out there and we've gone over these a few times with you. So we're hoping you'll remember that one of them is within Boulder County and we have folks from Boulder County here too, which, which is great. But one was within the Boulder County subregion, which is 21st and Main Street. And it's basically just to do a study to figure out how to get bikes and peds through and uh, or, or across that intersection in a, a much safer way than today. We have a greenway that terminates on the east side. We have what's called a, it's more of a complete street or an uh, enhanced multi-use corridor that comes off of 21st that we're planning to restripe that roadway to allow buffered bicycle lanes instead of four lanes total. It would be one lane in each direction plus a buffered bikeway on 21st west of Main Street. So how do we connect these facilities safely in the future? So. We uh, don't have the expertise, the full expertise to figure that all out because there's a lot of moving parts to that. So we need to go out uh, to a consulting firm. And so we're asking for federal dollars to help us with that study because it's right now these studies are running about a million dollars a piece, which sounds just crazy to me, um, thinking of it being that much money. But uh, things being what they are and the, and the, the state of costs right now, that's what the going rate is. So. 
we're looking for the for the feds or for the uh, for the for these grant programs to help us with 90% of the costs. So we'll be going for 90% of the costs uh, from that program, and we'll provide 10%. So it, it's a pretty good deal for us. So that's the first one, and it is just a study. The second one is going through uh, Weld County's sub-regional forum. So Southwest Weld is, por portion of Southwest Weld is in the Denver Regional Council of Government, so within the region, the Denver region. And so um, we are going for a grant for County Light Road, north of 17th, from 17th to State Highway 66, uh, expanding that roadway width to add bicycle lanes in each, one bicycle lane in each direction. So uh, if you look at the road today, you'll see that it's basically a, just a white stripe right on the edge of the roadway, and then it drops into a swale. So um, we're trying to expand some of that area. I think it's gonna help all roadway users. I mean, even people could, we've had people, we've, we have pictures of people walking that corridor. So in the dirt, basically on the side of the road. We have a lot of people who wanna bicycle that corridor, and it's very frustrating because you have great facilities to the south of it. So anyway, these are the things, these are the two projects that we're going for in this call number two. And the reason why it's just just two projects is because it's a very short time frame for spending that money. So we needed projects that we had the capacity to manage as well as we're ready to go. And so we feel like these are the two projects. So just to give you a heads up on that, are there any questions regarding those two projects? And we'll come back as we move through call three and four, which are coming up in the later part of this year, we'll expound on some of this. And as we get, if we get, if we're lucky enough to get the grant dollars or skillful enough to get those grant dollars, uh, we'll be back and, and give you the update on whether we were successful or not. I just wanted to mention, thank you for that. Before oh. let's jump in. We did skip a point of order on the, on the agenda. We will come back to that oh, in a yeah, moment. Sorry. We did want to tell you too, um, before we complete we do have, that. that is for actual construction. So those are dollars for construction. And that's running about $3.4 million just for bike lanes for that stretch of roadway. So we can go back if you'd like. <laughs> Sorry, you answered my question about how much your, um, the $3.4 million is asking. And again, question. we'll be asking for 90%. Well, actually, we're going to ask for 89% so we can get an extra point for being over 10%. <laughs> so we're going to ask for both of these projects, we're asking for 89% and the city's providing 11%. The, uh, the county line road, uh, and that's coming from Dr. Cog, or is that coming from the feds as well? It's, it's federal dollars that, that flow through the Denver Regional Council of Government. So okay. they, they score all the projects. And luckily, we'll just have to score that project within Southwest Weld for a county line road, and then just within Boulder County for our study. And so we don't have to be evaluated region-wide. We just go through those sub-regions, those county, which is a much, uh, it, it's a much quicker and easier process because you're just working with your peers in those counties. Any other questions? Shall we catch up to the one that we missed at this point? All right, um, our next thing is to approve the minutes of our last meeting. Do I have a motion regarding approving the minutes of the last meeting? I move to approve the minutes from uh, the June meeting. I second that motion. Any discussion? Do I abstain since I wasn't here? Or is that what it is? Yes. That's a really good question that I don't know the answer okay. to. <laughs> I think they have to abstain because they yeah had no input and. Okay. Then do but we then we're going to be yeah then we'll be short on our quorum. Then I have a quorum. <laughs> <laughs> Um, we will pose. Um, I yeah. propose that we postpone to the next time, like everything else. Anyone want to disagree with that? We're postponing. Thank you. So the second item on our communications from staff is just to give you a general update of. Uh, we've been working 
within the regional context of the city of Boulder, Boulder County, and uh, the Colorado Department of Transportation to go after a raise grant. And Boulder County was really the, the lead agency for this application. We've gone, at, we've gone for this the last two years, kind of on our own, but with the county and the city's and CDOT's support. But this time, and that was just for Hover and, and uh, 119 or, or Ken Pratt Boulevard. So we were just going for the intersection improvements. And you may, some of you may have heard that from past meetings. So, um, but this time we've broadened the scope to be the entire corridor because that's really what the uh, uh, US Department of Transportation is looking for is more proje projects that were really much more uh, regional in nature and had a lot more buy-in from all the regional partners. So Boulder County was kind enough to step up and take on that lead role and really talk about it as a corridor. But the great thing was we could still keep the project at Hover and 119 or Ken Pratt Boulevard at, as, part of that, as part of that project. So uh, we're hoping to go or hear back on this raise grant opportunity uh, sometime in August, middle of August, so middle of next month. And uh, it's pretty significant. Twenty-five million dollars would go to the to that project, and we would. I think you know the project is to, or some of you know the project is to take the boulder-bound lanes and put them underneath the roadway, along with a box, cold, or a, a, we call it a box, but a a side-running bike path that would also go underneath Hover. So we'd have the roadway and the bike path parallel to each other as they went under the roadway, and that really frees up a lot of capacity and takes away a lot of safety concerns that we've had at that intersection and takes away a lot of the crashes that we've had at that intersection as well. So a couple things going on there that we're pretty excited about. So any questions with that? With that, I'll move on to First and Main Transportation Hub, Kaufman Street Busway update. We just wanted to keep you in the loop and give you information on those two items. Um, I'll let Jim chat a little bit about First and Main first. So a quick uh, status update, uh, for the record, Jim Angstadt, uh, Director of Engineering Services. Um, and first in Maine, um, we are still working with uh, RTD on the uh, intergovernmental agreement uh, that spells out uh, them giving us the, the dollars for it and uh, what, uh, how we're going to spend them and, and what we're working on. So that's in process. Uh, part of that agreement of the match for that 17, the 17 million as part of that is for the city to, to fund the property acquisitions. The, we have started working on that. Appraisals are for almost all the properties are completed. We've made a few offers. We're working with those property owners. Um, we will be looking to start design um, probably in the early part of the fall for the roadway improvements and then um, probably we'll be replatting the property. Uh, so we'll be working on those items later this year. I'll talk a little bit about Kaufman. Uh, so Kaufman Street north of this site. So he was, Jim was really saying more about kind of those roadway improvements right in front of the site, which it's a brand new roadway from Boston to first. From first north, we're all, we also have a project and you've probably heard a lot about that so far, but we are in the phase where we're looking for what's called 90% design. So we're really at the final stages of design. We've had some great input from our bicycle community, which um, board member Wickland has been part of. So we really appreciate his, his input on that and uh, uh, have some very interesting designs for bike bicycling through that corridor. So I know some people bicycled here tonight, so I think they did. Um, <laughs> so, um, that's been interesting, but we're looking to get to that 90% design. And you'll see this, this will come out into the public one more, one last time before we really finalize the design and move to that construction phase. Cool. Me again. Um, finally, from, from my point of, point of view with the, more of the transportation planning, and I do more of the long range planning uh, with the city, is the uh, Northwest Peak Rail Service Study. And we're we're one of the uh, one of the entities that's working on that with uh, regional transportation district RTD. So we're trying to work out the exact like how much it's going to cost. What do you need to do with uh, Burlington Northern? Well, BNSF they're not called Burlington Northern Santa Fe anymore. Just the they're just the acronym of the letters, I guess. Um, but we're we really need to get dive down into those costs and exactly what engineering needs to be done to make it 
so we can have three trains in the morning come from Longmont all the way to Denver through Boulder and three trains in the evening coming back. So it really is a commuter peak hour or pre-peak time rail. And that's, the idea there is almost like just get the ball rolling and get things going so that people understand what the rail entails and get people in, interested in it. And as ridership grows, and then we've seen this in other parts of the country, as the ridership grows on that very skeletal system, uh, we can expand it then. But it really is about getting sightings so that the freight can move over and the passenger rail can get past the freight. Um, but with only three trains, they probably leave like every half hour. And so you'd have three trains just kind of, and they'd be very short, like two car, three car, four car sets at the most. And as they went in, um, that very last train, the freight could follow then and the freight could still use the corridor. So there's a big issue with how does this work operationally and we just need to prove it out to the BNSF railroad company that we can make it work. They're going to work with RTD on this as well. So there's a lot of moving parts, but we're finally getting that place where we're all partnering together instead of in 2004 when RTD basically just kind of said, well, um, it's existing track and we know that others have worked with the railroad in the past. So we're expecting that the railroad will work with us. Well, when that actually came to fruition, the railroad said, well, we think it's worth a lot more than we did back in 2004. And so that kind of started some negotiation that didn't go well for us in Longmont. So that's what's happening there. We hope to be done in about 16 more months of study, unfortunately. But when we're at the end of the study, we should have costs and all the things associated with building that out correctly. Thanks. Did you say three trains from Denver to Longmont and then from Longmont to Boulder? Or is it from Denver to Boulder? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, that wasn't clear. Um, every morning, three trains leaving in half-hour intervals would leave Longmont and pick up folks at First and Main and then uh, head down the corridor to Boulder for the Boulder Station and then go through Louisville, um, Broomfield, and then to Westminster, and then into Denver Union Station. So that would be three trains basically every half hour in the morning. And then in the afternoon, it would just be the reverse. So people coming back to these communities would uh, use one of those three trains, leaving probably a half hour or an hour apart, and come back. And so the trains would always be stored at the end of the day in Longmont. So we'd always be starting our trains off, and then they'd hang out in Denver for the afternoon until they came back. Is, is what RTD has told us so far. Do you have any idea how long that would take, or is that part of the study? Right now it's uh, estimated to take 65 to 70, 70 minutes total time running. Okay. So people say, well, that's a lot longer than it takes me to drive to Denver. And we say, today that's probably true, but in 5, 10, 15, 20 years, as the congestion increases, uh, the train may become or more competitive with that travel time. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. So how many station stops would there be in total? I believe there's six total stations. Thank and you. And their RTD is asking us not to increase that at all. All right, um, Phil asked me to provide you a quick update on some of our ongoing projects, uh, 2022 street trail construction progress and some upcoming road and bridge and trail work. Um, so as you're driving around town, you're gonna see it's summer, so there's a lot of construction. Uh, not all of it is roadway related, but some of it does impact roadways. Uh, so I'm gonna try to cover quite a few um, transportation projects, and then a couple of water, there's some water projects out there that you should be aware of uh, that impact uh, some of our roadways. Um, so starting off just some asset management items, um, we're undertaking our asphalt rehab. Uh, and when I usually talk about asphalt rehab, that's gonna be like a mill and resurface um, and put down new asphalt. So currently there, if you're up uh, off of Long's Peak by Roosevelt Park, they're working on that roadway um, between Kaufman and Bowen. 
Um, so uh, I think they've got it milled now, and they'll be putting down asphalt, I think, this week, and then finishing that up. Then they're going to move over to the um, the next month over to the west side of town and uh, rehab Clover Basin from Airport to Grandview Meadows. Um, the chip seal uh, is another um, asset management item that is currently ongoing on Third Avenue. So if you've been out there, um, there's a lot of little stones on the road. Uh, so they were uh, uh, applying the uh, the sealant and the chips uh, or, uh, late last week. Um, they're going to go through and they'll they'll what's called fog seal it, uh, which will hold all the the chips in place. Um, that should be going on this week. And then they'll restripe it. And that, uh, if we recall, that was uh, also adding some more bike lanes in that area, changing, reducing some of the lane configurations, uh, but providing a better bike facility. Um, also on third, excuse me, and that chip seal was from Martin to State Highway 119 uh, on the east side of town. Um, over kind of on the west side of town or the west side of Main Street um, on Third Avenue, we've been, we're finishing up a water rehab. Um, so I believe by the end of this month, they should be done uh, on 3rd. Um, and so you'll see um, we've had some day-to-day -day detours uh, while they're working block to block. Uh, they're wrapping that up shortly. And so um, that project, um, we're going to let that trench settle over winter. Um, then we'll be coming back next year and rehabbing that road as well as part of our asphalt management. So uh, it'll be a little dicey for a while. We'll do some temp repairs. Um, but uh, we don't want to go in this year and, and repave it uh, only to have a trench settle. So we usually like to give it a year. Um, and then rehab is also going to be going on or water rehab uh, replacements also going to be going on on Longs Peak um, just east of Bowen uh, before we repave it a little bit this year. They got a line going in. They want to get that done. Um, so some of our other roadway projects, uh, we are finishing, and we finished the design on the Boston Avenue bridge replacement. That's down by Left Hand Brewery over the St. Varane Creek. That's part of our, one of the components of our resilient St. Varane project where we will widen out the bridge, uh, lengthen it to carry a hundred year storm. Um, that bidding process is underway. We anticipate we'll probably see construction probably in late fall um, on that one. Um, Key thing to note is that that uh, the plan is for um, traffic on Boston to be maintained, uh, so the contractor will be staging the bridge construction. Um, the, as Phil indicated, Kaufman Street design that uh, is uh, continuing. Um, one thing you will see this year is we're going to go in and do the water line replacements on Kaufman this year. So we will see construction um, on Kaufman. One of the uh, before we go in and start kind of ripping up the road, we want to. We've got a lot of utilities, uh, both public and private, to get worked on. Uh, the water line is one of those components. Uh, there will be some other uh, other utilities, the gas that need to be relocated early next year before we kind of get into construction on Kaufman in, in the later end of next year. Um, as Phil indicated, the county line road project we are looking to get uh, tip money for. Construction, we have started design on that, which was also, I think, TIP funded as well. Um, we've got, uh, I think, 250000 um, which is about, I think, 50% of the of the design cost. So that is underway now. It's a very fast, we're fast tracking it. We need to have the design by next year uh, so we can go to construction. So that is underway. Um, uh, 17th Avenue Sidewalks, a multimodal project, uh, replacing the an old asphalt walk on the north side of 17th Avenue from, let's see, I think it's Bowen Street to Cook Court. Um, design is completed now. We are in the property acquisition phase where we're purchasing uh, right away and some easements from those property owners. Um, we are about, I want to say 75 to 80% complete with those. Uh, anticipating going to bid a tail end of this summer and then construction over the winter. Uh, there is um, an irrigation ditch through there, so we need to go to construction uh, before uh, and get some of those items relocated before next spring. Um, another trail project we're working on is the third phase of the Spring Gulch Number 2, uh, which runs from uh, the south end of Reunion Reservoir and will run south and then connect to the underpass just north of or just north of 119 by Sandstone Ranch. So that project is about 90% design, um, trying to get to bid by the end of the year to go to construction next year. Uh, the key component for that um, 
kind of quick schedule is we need to get a crossing under the railroad. So we will need uh, to take an application to PUC for that. Um, although the railroad is, has been willing to work with us. So we're not seeing, um, thinking there's gonna be any delays. Um, different, railroad. different railroad than BNSF. <laughs> A uh, couple other items real quick, uh, some signal work uh, we're working on. Um, we have uh, a, we received a grant last year uh, for the F Highway Safety Improvement Program. Um, it was, uh, I think, a $900,000 project. We got about $800,000 from the state. It is mostly miscellaneous signal work throughout the city for safety improvements. Um, that project, I believe, is out to bid now and, and will be starting up uh, before the end of summer. Um, we're basically replacing a couple signal poles, a lot of signal heads um, throughout the city on, on non-state roads. Um, we are currently working on design for a traffic signal, um, hopefully for construction next year at uh, Route 66 and Alpine. Um, we, we feel that we'll be meeting warrants very soon, so we wanna have, be ready and have the design done. Um, and then CDOT is also still working on traffic signals on Main Street. Uh, I believe at Mountain View and Sixth, uh, they have the new poles in and they've pulled off the job until the cross arms come in. So we're seeing a little more delays than we would like, but um, that project is underway. Um, just to keep you informed, uh, we have a neighborhood mitigation project going on right now. Um, that is on North Gay Street um, from Mountain View to 17th. Um, we have been working with the neighbors. Um, it meets our criteria. We've proposed a few things. We're taking it back to them to see if that's gonna meet with what they want. Uh, if it does, we'll go in and construct uh, those uh, improvements later this year. More than likely, it's going to be some speed tables. Um, so, um, not necessarily transportation or CIP work that the city takes on, but, um, most of our road expansion is done by developers. So what you're gonna be seeing, um, just some information, uh, Costco, um, if uh, on the east side of town off of 119, uh, they are going like gangbusters out there. They're finishing up the um, utilities now. They're gonna start cutting roads very sh shortly and we are gonna be installing the traffic signal there later in the beginning of fall. So uh, just an item, once those uh, projects are completed, they will become public streets. Um, we also have a project called Mountain Brook, which is, uh, they're building a road. It's kind of behind the, the Target and the Home Depot on the west side of town. Uh, they're building about a quarter mile to half mile of road for that development. Uh, that also involves the Veterans um, Community Project as well. So um, they have to get those roads up and running. Um, get them open before they start can start building homes out there. Um, and then there's another project you see behind the hospital in the east side of town called the Highlands. Um, they've done most of their road work uh, there, but yeah, you're starting to see homes come out of the ground there as well. Uh, so those are just some of the development projects kind of you see um, usually uh, on larger parcels, they will involve roadways. Um, one of the criteria the city has is, as I indicated, they cannot get building permits to go vertical, start building homes until we provide what's called construction acceptance for the public improvements, which is water, wastewater, storm, and the roadway system. So we're guaranteed that those roads are built and can provide uh, services for the public before we, they actually are granted certificates of occupancy. Um, and with that, I'll open it up to any questions. First, let me say, you guys are very busy. So I appreciate you being here. This is your busy time of year, I imagine, and you have a lot of projects going. Um, I, it, just um, the discussion about the trails and the bike paths made me think about um, the email that uh, board member uh, Lehner sent out regarding a, a program that assesses a city for uh, how bike friendly it is, I think. I think, Mr. Greenwald, you, you sent that out to all of us. And I just wondered if you could also forward that to the two new board members. Yeah, uh, something that um, struck me about that program is they talked about uh, networking, networking the trails, how important that was. And I just wanted to ask you, Mr. Anstead, how, where do you think we are in terms of networking our bike, 
uh, accessibility? Do you think we're at 90 percent? Do you think we're 50 percent? What, what do you, you know, given the whole project that, that you have in mind? I'll answer a question with a question. When you talk about networking, what do you, with the, the surrounding communities, um, with the state? Uh, <laughs> Well, first of all, how do you think we're doing just in the city, within the city? I don't know. We do all right. <laughs> I, I think there's, 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 there are challenges. Um, you know, we're, we've been working with our, on RSVP to kind of on the Greenway Trail. It's been under a detour for years because of, of, of work. Um, I think there's always room for improvement um, in terms of, of how we prioritize some of our projects. Uh, I think we can, we can, city can do a better job of, of kind of prioritizing and chasing dollars. Um, we have been working with um, some of the surrounding communities. Uh, um, actually, we were meeting today to talk about uh, connecting a trail on the east side from Union Reservoir uh, into Mead through some of the city's open space. Um, you know, I don't know that we've achieved a lot in networking, but I think we're, we're our hearts are in the right place and we're, we're trying. Um, you know, we'll, part of the raise grant includes uh, a bicycle uh, connection down into Boulder uh, along the 119 corridor. So, um, you know, I think um, as we try to get out of cars, um, we need to build a better bike system, uh, whether it's on our roads or through our trails. And uh, I think there is a lot of plans out there um, for that. We just have to execute them. Do you have a, uh, a map of the, the bike trails in town that, that the public can access? Our bike, our bike map guy is sitting behind me. His name's Ben Ortiz, so stare at him really okay. intently. Um, but no, he, we, have the bike, we have a bike map online that we try to keep up to date as possible. It's, it's, it's getting a little stale, quite frankly, so we're right now working on the new version of the map. And as, as Jim pointed out, we have some closures that have impacted our system. And so uh, the map won't reflect those in the future because we just need to, we'll be close enough, I think, to having it done that we, will, we won't show it. But we have a lot of interactive maps that keep up to date on the closures that are happening today uh, and so that you can look at that. So we try to keep that up to date as best we can. But the, the new map is coming. And then we also have um, what I, we, we often share the Envision Longmont trail system map, which is our comprehensive plan for the city. So that shows kind of what we're planning to build in the future and, and kind of gets to that connectivity issue that you were raising earlier. And so uh, that shows uh, those needed connections. And so it's a matter of prioritizing those, which Envision Longmont tries to do, but you know, we can always take any input that you might have or that the city council may have or other boards and commissions, quite frankly, on. Uh, you know, what needs to be moved up in priority. And we will be refreshing that those documents in the coming years, hopefully within the next year or two. We've been kind of pushing back some of the updates to our roadway plan, to our Envision Longmont, uh, our transportation plan. Boulder County has a transportation master plan, so that's what we're going to try to mirror is something more like a transportation master plan and, and talk about how we prioritize all different modes rather than just typically it's just been streets, and in the last uh, couple of iterations, we have put bicycle infrastructure in there as well, so and, and pedestrian infrastructure. So where where do we find this map? I will or send out a link. Or? When I send okay. out the other information to our new board members, I'll send out the link to everyone. The, the links, uh, plural, because we'll send out the existing bike map as well as the uh, Envision Longmont map so you can see what's being planned. And some of that's already been done, so that's kind of where we're at. Once you finish a map, that next day it's pretty much obsolete. You know, it gets out of date. So uh, we'll do the best we can here. With and, and like most bicyclists, usually we, we try to follow the maps and then we go, oh, hmm, well, that's closed, so how do we work around that? But I know um, board member Osborne mentioned in our last meeting in June about um, Google. You know, when do we update with Google? It's really hard to find bike directions on Google Maps uh, right now through Longmont. That's a great point. We'll, we'll, we'll work with, we have some uh, pretty intelligent GIS folks who work with the Google and we try to get road closures on there if it's a long-term road closure 
and we try to get uh, path closures on there as well. So we'll work with them. They're very keyed into those connections. So thank you. All right. Thank you, gentlemen. If there's nothing else, we'll move right on. And I kind of promised uh, Angel she'd get to go on about a half hour ago, but uh, <laughs> that's me being a big mouth. And I think we need to have the public invited to be heard. Oh, portion. sorry. Thank you. Is there anyone in the public that wishes to speak? Do we have anyone on a phone or anything? Seeing none, we will move on to the next point on the agenda. Sorry, I'm all over the place today. Um, so today we have uh, Angel Bond from Boulder County, and she can introduce her and give you her title and all those good things. But uh, she's working or has worked on the Boulder County Mobility and Access for All Ages and Abilities Plan. So with no further ado, I'll turn it over to Angel to explain what that means. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah, okay. Thank you, Phil. Um, and let's see if I can get this going here. Okay, we're good. Okay, um, so as Phil said, my name is Angel Bond. I'm the Mobility for All Program Manager with Boulder County. Unfortunately, one of my, my fellow project managers, she wasn't able to attend. So Cami um, Edson, she is the co-project manager on this project. And um, this is the first time that I think we've been, that we've shown this to you all. So if you have any questions, please just ask. Uh, let me know if you uh, want clarification on anything. And I think I'm gonna take out down my mask, but okay. So here's just a little bit about this project. So the Coordinated Human Services Transportation Plan is kind of a wonky term. Um, and really what it is, is it's a federally required plan that helps improve transportation access for older adults, people with disabilities, low-income populations. And in this particular case, we've actually included our youth transportation program in this as well. So that is not necessarily typical, but we felt like it was close enough to some of the other funding streams in that there's a special set aside for safe routes to school. Um, this is, the intent of this plan is not for Boulder County to go out and implement all of the strategies that we have in here. It's so that we have a coordinated vision with all of our stakeholders and all of our partners. And we are pretty broad with our term um, stakeholder and partners because there's lots of people who are involved in the transportation space. There's private nonprofits that provide transportation like via mobility services or Cultivate. There's also um, just for profit like Ztrip, which is a taxi company, Uber, Lyft. So we're pretty much, we're pretty broad with the definition of like who our stakeholders are. This is a locally developed coordinated plan. There is a version of this at the regional level. And this is the first time that we've done this plan at our level at Boulder County. So the goals and the objectives of this plan really are to first and foremost improve accessibility. So if you are in a wheelchair, if you have a walker, if you use a cane, this would address some of your transportation needs. Equity, um, as you all were introducing yourselves, I heard a lot of you talking about equity. Um, equity is definitely a cornerstone central to this plan. Reliability of the transportation services. So a lot of um, the demographic groups within our communities, um, they deal with pretty unreliable transportation services like IntelliRide. I'm not sure if you all are familiar with that. We also focus on efficiency, sustainability, and safety. And really the biggest um, unifying factor of this plan is that we're human-centered and we focus on the unique needs of the demographic groups that we've planned for. We've had a pretty extensive engagement process. We had a technical advisory committee, which we had municipalities, um, the school districts, the local transportation providers involved in that. And we met throughout the process, I think we met six different times to be able to form the strategies. We also had um, other community partners that we did one-on-one -on -one interviews with um, to make sure that their perspectives were incorporated. And then we had affinity groups. Um, so this was all, we launched it during COVID. We did a, a pretty robust infinity group and that's basically a focus group where we got together different demographic groups that had um, similar transportation needs. The plan is posted online and um, this is kind of, it has an executive summary body that really went, goes over like what the process was, what the existing conditions are. They have some wonderful maps there that I will forward on to you all. Um, that have a transit propensity index. And basically they look at the geographic 
um, dispersion of populations that are more likely to depend on transit. So that would be older adults, people with disabilities, youth, uh, low-income folks, and zero-car households. And we did a heat map of where those populations um, lived and looked at the transit service to make sure that it actually ma like matched where the need was. And so it allows us to identify priority areas where we can improve transit for those demographic groups. And then there's also some appendices that um, do an inventory of different transportation providers and people who provide bus pass support for folks or other transportation supports. And then um, what is new in this is that we have the transportation youth concepts, um, which Cami Edson, she's our youth trans transportation program manager, um, that really was instrumental to make sure that we incorporate youth in um, all of our strategies. Um, we held a, a feedback process. We're going, the next step is that we're gonna go to the commissioners on July 28th for adoption. So um, one of the reasons why I'm coming here to you is to sh share what those strategies were because we did a pretty extensive engagement process so that hopefully you all can also incorporate some of these strategies into your planning processes as you move forward. And also so that you understand kind of the um, grants that we're applying for and just in general, the general direction. Um, it's really important that we get your feedback on this. So we have a whole host of strategies, um, and, but we've broken them up into different tiers. I'm gonna just go over a couple of them. Um, these strategies are supposed to be reasonably implementable within the next five years. So we know that there's more needs than what we've been able to identify in this plan, but we want to work together with our partners like the school districts to really accomplish something within the next five years. So we've tried to get things that are pretty attainable. We also have outlined some longer term projects, or not projects, but priorities, um, so that we can make sure that we're on a common page whenever we're looking at longer term policies. So the first kind of bucket of strategies is data strategies. Here, um, the first tier, so things that we're going after funding for or we've already implemented, are a Boulder County Transit Plan. We've already set aside $100,000 to really start that. Um, as Phil had mentioned, we do have a transportation master plan, but it doesn't get into things like scheduling, connections, um, kind of those nuts and bolts of a transit plan. So we really know that we have to, moving forward, have our own locally derived transit plan. There's also Vision Zero Safe Routes to School Action Plan that Cami's program is um, going to be applying for TIP funding for. And really what that is, is it's how do we create a process to identify the priorities for Vision Zero projects that impact youth? Um, and how do we prioritize those collectively and help with local match and really support each other's projects as we move forward through grant applications? Um, and then tier two is kind of that three to five years, and that's really formalizing data analysis so that we have a common understanding of what the transportation system is and the needs are. And then also looking at the cost effectiveness of subsidizing taxi vouchers or Uber and Lyft um, credits. The next is pretty instrumental, but unfortunately, Boulder County doesn't have a lot of influence over this, so that's one of the reasons why we're talking to you all. Um, access strategy, ensuring that there's paved routes accessing bus stops. Um, but Boulder County does have bus stops in unincorpor unincorporated Boulder County, but you all have a lot more. So really, this is prioritizing those connections through sidewalks so that people can access bus stops year round. We know that when it snows, a lot of people in wheelchairs or even older adults that have difficulty walking have a hard time getting to the bus stop, and so they can be isolated for long periods of time. The next is really looking at cost strategies. I think the first tier is, um, you have a great example here with Ride Free Longmont, but really we understand that transportation is expensive, and especially if you look at it in combination with housing and transportation, um, our area is really not that affordable for working class families and low income households and seniors on fixed incomes. So when we look at how much somebody be, should be spending on transportation and housing combined, it should be around 45% of their income. So when older adults age into social security, um, that's really not very much, especially with the housing market that we have here. So we want to expand affordable transportation options, understanding that that can help get people below that 45%. 
We also want to work with um, community liaisons of nonprofits um, and help subsidize bus passes in areas where they need them. Here you have the local buses free, but there's still a significant need to go regionally to travel to Boulder. So how do we cover those bus passes uh, through grant applications and program budgets? Next is really focusing on resource strategies. Um, so the big um, elephant in the room is the driver shortage. It doesn't just affect RTD, it affects the school districts, it affects nonprofits that have volunteer driver programs, it affects Hop, Skip, Drive, which is like a Uber for children, it affects Uber, it affects Lyft, there's a driver shortage all around. So really a lot of these strategies that we've laid out really are contingent upon us being able to address that driver shortage and training program. So um, working collectively, um, hopefully we can advance the, or at least promote, raise awareness about the need of drivers in our community because they really are instrumental in people being able to age in place. If you don't have a driver that can take you to a doctor's appointment, you're not necessarily gonna be able to stay in your home as you age. Or if you have after school programs as kids um, and you can't get to those, then you're not gonna be able to uh, be as involved in your community. There's also a provision for the Safe Routes Regional Hub. And what that is, is the youth transportation program um, at Boulder County would hopefully um, be in a role of capacity building for local municipalities and local partners. And what that means is um, there's a lot of planning and data collection that goes into applying for the Safe Routes grants. So really kind of being that central hub to collect that data to be competitive for the grants that are upcoming. There are a couple other there, other um, tier two there as far as like a volunteer travel ambassador program. What a travel ambassador program is, is somebody who goes out with people on their first trip on the bus. So really investing in those types of programs that make riding transit less intimidating. Because that is one of the things that we hear is that I would love to ride the bus, but I just don't know how. It, no, I um, not only have to know where the bus picks me up, I have to know when it's coming, I have to know what to pay, I have to know like what, how to stop the bus. So there's a lot of things that we kind of take for granted if you don't grow up riding the bus um, or if you don't do it on a regular basis. So how do we really demystify that anxiety that people have, especially youth, if their parents, um, and also working with their parents, if they don't necessarily want them to travel on the bus by themselves, how do we kind of take that family approach? Um, so that's one of the longer term strategies that we're addressing. Um, also, there's the service gap strategies. So there's a couple of things, I'll just touch on a few of these. Um, so for example, if you have a disability and you can't use the fixed route bus, you could be eligible for the RTD Accessor Ride program. Currently, you have to travel to Denver to get certified for that program. That can be really intimidating for a lot of the people with disabilities that I work with. Um, if we could bring that certification to people here in Boulder County, um, that would be great because then it would reduce the travel time and reduce the intimidation about going to Denver to be able to get certified. There's also um, strategies for supporting volunteer driver programs, especially in areas where there's not um, a lot of density. So in the mountain region, uh, really that first line should probably be a volunteer driver because people are just so dispersed that it's hard to have like fixed route transit that's pretty effective in the mountains. Um, another thing that I would like to point out is that we've included veterans in here as being um, special needs transportation, and that's um, not necessarily because of a disability or anything like that, but usually veterans, they have to use the VA medical system, and so they have to travel to um, Cheyenne or Aurora, which can provide, a, it can be really a significant barrier for people to access the VA hospitals. The next is just to raise awareness of transportation options. So um, really that travel training that I spoke about with the volunteer ambassadors, teaching people how to ride the bus, demystifying it for families. Um, also working with human services who are that first point of contact and that's kind of central to my program, Mobility for All, but really making sure that we're talking to the people who see people in need every single day so that they know how to refer people to transportation options. And then also just in general, coordinate different funding streams. So there's over 165 different federal funding streams that can fund transportation, but 
Um, as you, I'm sure you all are aware, if you have a funding pot, um, there's nothing that requires them to talk to somebody else who has a similar funding pot from a different source. So really getting like the older American Act dollars to talk to the local um, IDD mill levy folks. So IDD is intellectual and developmental disabilities. So really trying to get those funding streams to talk to each other and work on um, bicycle repairs. Um, so this is one of the youth strategies that we have. Like um, teaching youth how to maintain and uh, repair bicycles can be really a great way to help raise awareness of what it takes to bicycle and then also provide them good vocational skills. The ongoing policies, this is something that we don't have a ton of control over at the county level, but we're definitely spreading the word about it. Um, thoughtful land use planning and um, coordinate that with transportation. This is something that everybody talks about, like the best transportation plan is a good land use plan, right? Because your transportation is what connects you to where you want to go and how you live your life. So really thinking about how do we plan our land use so that it supports multimodal transportation and kind of get us thinking outside of just the car box. Also universal design, which um, that's um, something that is above and beyond ADA. So the Americans with Disability Act has a certain, um, has certain criteria for building slopes and cross slopes, but it's not always welcoming and inviting. So how do we go a step above to where we're designing for everybody, whether they're in a wheelchair or they have a stroller, um, and they don't necessarily have to take like a back road to get into some place. They don't have to take a ramp that's not been thought of in advance. Also, how do we ensure that we're sharing data? This seems like something that is a um, that we should take for granted, but really if we can't share data and we can't have the same data standards, it's really hard to get the big picture of what's really going on with transportation. And then how do we continue equitable investment in communities and programs and infrastructure that really impact low-income households, BIPOC households, people, BIPOC is um, black, indigenous, people of color, um, how do we make sure that everybody is really included in those transportation planning processes? So um, we've already kind of started implementing some of these, even though um, we launched in 2020. So we've been doing a school travel study. By we, I mean Cami and her team. They've been working with a researcher at CU to really find out what families' travel needs are for school. Uh, we've been continuing um, to teach people how to maintain a bike. So we've been doing earn a bike workshops um, that we consult out. So um, there's a picture up there of one that we recently did where um, people spend like about a half day learning how to maintain a bike and then they get a travel plan that's personalized to them. We've also launched things like Ride Free Lafayette, which is a new on-demand service that we launched during the pandemic. Um, so those are just a couple of highlights of things that we've already started implementing. Um, and then also we're seeking funding, funding for things like the volunteer driver program in the mountains for bike rodeos and safety training um, for the Vision Zero Safe Routes to School um, safety plan. And then just in general, like how do we um, empower um, underserved youth to be able to be an active um, part in our planning processes. And then also, as I said, there's a lot of lists here that we um, can't do alone. So we're really working with our community partners, really like Cultivate, who serves veterans over 60 years old to get to Cheyenne or Aurora. How do we get them to possibly serve veterans that are 58 years old who also have those same travel needs? So really some of these things are minor um, policy tweaks, but others are a bigger lift that we really need to apply for funding for. And then those longer term policies, those um, are really gonna be hard to make a big dent on in the next five years, but we will continue to do um, an update to this plan. So this is a summary of all of the strategies that we've laid out um, and you can see them more in depth online and I sent Stacy a link to the plan website. Um, really our next steps are to go to the uh, Board of County Commissioners in July for our business meeting to get it adopted. We're continuing to integrate the recommendations of this into um, the UZA program of projects, which is the urbanized area, the FTA funds that Boulder County is receiving. Um, the Dr. Cog tip process, um, the program specific work plan. So in Boulder County, what are our programs incorporating? How are we incorporating them? 
And then MAC, that is the Mobility and Access Coalition. It's a um, coalition that I oversee of nonprofits and government programs sp specifically focused on um, improved transportation access for underserved populations. I know Sandy Stewart used to be on this. She's a really, she used to be a really active uh, part of the MAC. Um, and then also we're doing a speaking tour. So this you're the first stop on our speaking tour. Um, so we're basically trying to raise awareness of transportation as a basic human right. And I point out the fact that there's a lot of people in our community that can't drive a car. And if we're not planning for how they get around, then we're not building an equitable transportation system. So an equitable transportation system really is a system where you have the option of owning a car. It's not a necessity. So do you have any questions about the plan? I know that was a lot. Thank you for the presentation. Um, so how much are you, have you all asked for any of uh, funding from the infrastructure, um, you know, bill um, that where the money is being um, yeah. distributed for transportation and structure, road structures and things like that? So we have not, um, but there are, um, I think that this, um, the SS4A, what is like the safe roads uh, for all, like we, we might be exploring applying for that, not necessarily my program or the youth program, but um, Alex Hyde Wright, who's in our, he's our lead on the Vision Zero stuff, we might apply for that. A lot of these federal funding streams and also even the state funding streams, they require local match, right? So we really are looking at how do we provide consistent local match. That's another thing that I'm sure um, Kathleen has spoken to you all about, Kathleen Brackey, um, our supervisor. Um, the commissioners are considering extending our transportation sales tax um, in, at, like in November. So actually they're gonna have a public meeting for that on August 4th. Um, so if you're interested in that, that's where the commissioners will decide if they're gonna put it on the ballot to be able to extend it. Um, but that's farther, go ahead. Also, they're coming to our city council on July 26th to present to you about the uh, sales tax extension or continuation. Yeah. Okay. So that will be happening. So the, the federal, the bill and a lot of the federal funding, they do require local match dollars that we are trying to figure out how we can cover that to really have bigger projects. And the other question that I have, can you explain to me a little bit more in it? I mean, for me, yeah. um, the safe... Um, I don't remember the safe something for the kids. What does that look like? That's yeah, so the Safe Routes Hub, is yes. that what you're speaking of? Okay, so um, I'll do my best to channel my inner Cami Edson, um, but from what I understand, um, that is really a collaborative forum at the county level where we can strategically apply for um, Safe Routes funds. Um, so it's not just Safe Routes to School, it's also they have other funding streams like Safe Routes to Parks, Safe Routes to Grocery Stores. So it's really looking at youth transportation needs holistically. So looking at what, is, what are those after school needs perhaps, um, access to employment for youth as well, um, and then really coordinating those resources. So you have to do things like parent surveys to access the Safe Routes to School funding. Um, and if a municipality or a local school hasn't done baseline surveying of the parents, then they can't even apply for some of those grants. So really it's having the county take a bigger, um, a bigger part of like, that data collection and really prioritizing which projects as a region can we apply for and how do we prioritize which ones we go after which, uh, which um, funding cycle and then like how do we make sure that all the data and all the schools are eligible to apply for some of those funding streams, if that makes sense? So are both school districts on your list? So yes, Cami Edson works with both school districts. So she used to be the trip tracker coordinator just for St. Brain Valley School District at Boulder County. Her role has kind of broadened a little bit to be more youth transportation, generally speaking. She has very close relationships with both um, the St. Brain Valley School District and BVSD. And I believe they meet every other month. They have a like kind of a collaborative meeting talking about the upcoming funding um, cycle. The 
Safe Routes to School funding cycle opens up this fall, and that's the first time in two years that it's opened up. So I think right now they're kind of trying to figure out which projects to apply for grants for. I don't know if CDOT's going to change that to where it's every year again. It used to be every year, but they decided that they would do it every two years. Uh, but with COVID and everything, that might change. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions, comments? Yeah, I wanted to say thank you for a concise and really informative presentation and the booklet that was online of the work plan was really great. I wanted to reinforce to you how important um, transportation is to employment. It's mm -hmm. it, Right now, for, especially for these populations, transportation can be a barrier to employment, um, especially in the areas of reliability and cost. Uh, there is a person that lives in that, as it, the plan noted, there is a concentration of people with disabilities on the Gay Street Corridor mm -hmm. here in Longmont. And I know of a person that is older, definitely over 65, uses a cane, can't mm -hmm. walk more than about 30 feet, but wants to be employed. Yeah. And getting to work is really, really hard. A volunteer takes mm -hmm. her every morning at 6.30 to her yes. work. But when she leaves, after having earned right around $12, $13 an hour, yeah. her Uber is 25 Yeah. And that that's just not conscionable. She tries to get anyone else to come. They can't come on a regular basis. And mm -hmm. I think the most important two things we have to be looking for is reliability yeah. and the cost. And I just want to say thank you for seeing that and reinforce how important that is. Yeah, thank you very much. I actually just um, spoke with the Hour Center two weeks ago about their transportation challenges. And they said that one of the largest challenges that the people that they serve are experiencing is after hours transportation needs after the bus has stopped. And so they said that a lot of the people that they're serving are spending way too much on Uber and Lyft because there's no other transportation options at 11 o'clock when your job ends. So I definitely hear you that transportation to employment is central and it's not just a matter of cost and reliability, it's also when does it operate. If you have to work on Sundays and there's no service on Sundays, what do you do, right? So thank you very much. And um, I do think that Uber and Lyft have had a great impact in that it's on-demand service for people who haven't typically had the on-demand. Maybe they had to plan like three days in advance, but it can add up really quickly. Yeah. Any other comments or questions? Yeah. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, thank you for mentioning um, situations where land has been managed in such a way um, that it expects travel by car. And I'm just wondering, uh, in retrofitting some of these neighborhoods or um, also just facilities that are, are kind of isolated, what, what kind of solutions are you thinking might work in that scenario? So I'm not sure because I'm not an infrastructure person. I'm a programs and public engagement person. But I would say like more density where it where you can have more density and thinking intentionally about what is within that 20 minute walk of what you're building, right? So are there places, natural places where people can walk um, or bike that are within that walk or bike shed of whatever you're building? So currently I think I mean, mixed use development is really kind of the olden way that hopefully is coming back because that's what will access, people can have access to commercial areas or healthcare if it's within a like smaller footprint, but yeah. Mm -hmm. I too am interested in sort of a neighborhood focus mm -hmm. for yeah. transportation. So thank you for your presentation. That was very informative. Thank you. And if you're interested in transportation equity, just a plug for the Mobility and Access Coalition. We meet on the second Monday of the month, just like you all, but it's two to four, and we tackle some of these same issues monthly. So, And I do have my contact information and then Cami's contact information, so if you're interested more in learning about the Safe Routes um, hub, I would definitely reach out to her. Um, and just thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> Thank you, Angel, for the overview of your policies and programs. Mm -hmm. And I particularly want to applaud 
your focus on involving youth because long range planning is about the future and yeah. young people are about the future. So well done. Thank you. And I can't take much credit for that. That's Cami. that she's our like shining star with youth and getting involvement from youth. Um, really, I think that that's where we're going to get culture shift as well, right? That's where we're going to learn how to use other modes. And we will send out this presentation uh, as a PDF to all of you. So look forward Thank to that. Thank you so much. All right, in the absence of any action items, or are there any action items that have been added? All right. Um, in the absence of any action items, do we will have the comments for board from board members, and we'll begin at this end with Mr. Hinterberger, board member. Yeah, I need to turn your thing on. Yeah, there you go. Um, yeah, I don't have any prepared comments, but uh, just um, I wanted to say I, I thank you for the opportunity to serve on this board, and um, I know just sitting here the hour and 15 minutes that it's been, it's gonna be a great, great place to learn um, as well as have some input, so thank you. Thank you. Um, I guess it wasn't very fair to start with a newbies to not hear what, how we usually respond, um, but I figured I'd go this way and end with our, our uh, city council liaison. So next, um, Mr. Wickland. Well, I would have to Say the same same exact thing. Thank you for the opportunity to be here. Um, it will be a very interesting learning experience, that's for sure. Um, but it's, I think it's very exciting. Uh, the presentation was exciting. There's there's a lot of cool activities going to be coming on in the future. So. Thank you. Um, we'll proceed over here, and I never say your name right, Mr. McInerney. Mr. McInerney. McInerney. Sorry. Thank you. Would you turn on your mic? I just want to thank uh, Jim and Phil for the updates regarding ongoing and upcoming projects. Very informative. And Ms. Christ. Well, I would like to thank board member Osborne for running the board today. <laughs> Thank you, you did an excellent job. And thank you, uh, Mr. Greenwald and Mr. Um, uh, Angstead. Uh, and also just wanna appreciate um, Angel Bond coming from Boulder to explain all that to us. That's a, something that we wanna keep an eye on, I think, going forward. So um, well done, all. All right, and we have our city council liaison, Ms. Yarbrough. Right? Correct. Okay. Correct. Um, well, I just want to say, um, man, I just took notes on everything that you all are doing, and you are amazing. Um, so it make me look like I know something at the next city council meeting. Someone asked me about transportation. So, <laughs> yeah, this is what we're doing. So, no, I just want to say thank you so much um, for everything. And I see we are just moving trails, you know, just blazing. And um, I appreciate all the hard work that you all are doing. Thank you. Thank you. Um, our next, is, next meeting will be August 8th. Pardon? Did you have any oh, did I have any comments? <laughs> I skipped over me. I think I made my comment largely earlier, but thank you to everyone. Um, so next meeting's August 8th. And of course we will be, have on our agenda our um, election of the leader of this, leaders of this um, board, as well as carrying on the minutes. We will have hear about the capital improvement program and the bus fare buy-up. Is there anything else that we need to be thinking about coming into the next meeting? We think that's it, but we may have more. Oh, yeah. I think what's not on here is the the county would like to come back in August, another county presentation, so that's three in a row. 
with a US-287 uh, bus rapid transit update for you on their plan, and it's supposed to be short, so we'll see if we can keep that on the agenda, but we may push that off till September, but they'd like to go in August if they can. All right, we'll look forward to seeing that. Having come to the end of the items, do I hear a motion to adjourn? Okay, I make a motion to adjourn. <laughs> Anyone that, everyone that thinks we should adjourn, say yes. 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 It's unanimous. Thank you very much. It was great tonight.